Welcome to Lesson 3a, Leibniz Theorem. In this lesson, we'll first review the one-dimensional Leibniz Theorem, and then we'll extend it to three dimensions. I typed out the purpose of the one-dimensional Leibniz Theorem. It enables us to differentiate an integral in which both the integrand and the limits of integration are functions of the variable with which the integral is being differentiated. Here's the 1D Leibniz Theorem for some arbitrary function or property phi. Note that phi is a variable of x and t, as we wrote here. The integral is with respect to x, and the derivative is with respect to time. Leibniz says that this derivative of this integral is equal to this integral, where we put in the two limits. Notice that they are functions of time, del phi del t dx, plus these two terms, the derivatives of these limits a and b with respect to time, of phi evaluated at b t and at a t. I'll define each of these terms. The first one is the total rate of change of this volume integral of phi. This term represents the rate of change of phi due to unsteadiness, and that unsteadiness is the unsteadiness of phi itself, not the limits of integration. These two terms represent the rate of change of phi due to unsteadiness of the limits of integration, or you can think of a and b as the boundaries. We have all these terms because the limits or the boundaries are changing with time, and that is taken into account here. I'll do a simple example. Consider this expression. We want to simplify it as much as possible. I'll use the 1D Leibniz theorem. Here, a of t, the lower limit, is actually not a function of time. It's simply 0. b of t, the upper limit, is ct. And we also have to calculate del phi del t. phi itself is e to the minus x squared, as we see here compared to here, and I just realized that this should be an x instead of a t. Note that our phi is not a function of time here, but in general it can be. So this term with a del phi del t is 0. We'll also calculate db dt and da dt so that we could plug into this equation. Well, if a is 0, da dt is also 0, and since b is ct, db dt equals c. Now let's plug in the Leibniz equation. I rewrote the Leibniz equation here. We know that del phi del t is 0. We know that dA dt is 0. And we know that db dt is c. Phi at x equal b and some time is e to the minus x squared, where x is now b, or e to the minus b squared. But here b is ct, so this is e to the minus c squared t squared. Putting all this together, the only term left is this term, or this term here. So we have c times this exponential term. So this is our final answer. I challenge you to try to figure this out without using the Leibniz theorem. No way, dude. I'd rather have my teeth drilled, man. Well, Joe, I guess, like many people, you don't like doing math. You got that right, dude. Now let's extend the 1D Leibniz theorem to three dimensions. Again, for some function or property phi, where phi in general is a function of both spatial vector x and time. And by the way, both of these apply at any instant in time. Here's the 1D form of the Leibniz equation. We extend it to 3D by changing the limits from just a and b to some volume. So this is now a volume integral instead of just an integral with respect to x. And in general, v can change with time. I point out that in my lessons, I use a line through a v to indicate volume so as not to be confused with the magnitude of velocity, which is capital V, without the line through it. This term is also a volume integral, but this term is an area integral where a of t is the surface area surrounding volume v of t. a of t can also change with time. Not all authors do this, but I like to put a circle around this area to indicate that it's a closed area, a closed surface. It's the entire boundary of volume v. Again, I'll label these terms. This term is the total rate of change of phi integrated over the whole volume. This term is the rate of change of phi due to unsteadiness of phi itself. Again, notice the del del t term, similar to what we had in the 1D version where we're taking the partial derivative of phi with respect to time. Now since we're integrating over the entire area, we no longer split this last term into two parts, 
but it's an area integral, which is the rate of change of phi due to movement or distortion of the volume's boundary. There's one other item here that I didn't talk about yet. We see a u vector sub a. This is the velocity of surface area a of t. Let's draw some arbitrary volume, v of t. I like to call it a potato. In fluid flow, there's some flow flowing through it, but v itself can be moving and or distorting in general. Consider some small element of area. dA is the outward normal, and since this area can also be moving, ua is the velocity of surface area a of t. Here the velocity of this little element, which is not necessarily in the same direction as the outward normal dA. There's also a fluid velocity, which is parallel to the streamlines. And just a caution here, do not confuse u and ua. This is the fluid velocity u. This is the velocity of this area element ua. I want to point out a special case, which is useful in fluid mechanics. That is, if ua equal u everywhere, and by everywhere I mean the whole volume. In other words, this whole potato is moving with the flow, distorting as necessary, but always moving with the flow. So volume v of t moves with the flow. Then our volume v of t is a material volume. We'll talk about this more in the next lesson. I just want to emphasize that this is a special case. In the general case, this volume can be moving in some arbitrary direction and distorting, regardless of what the flow is doing. And the 3D Leibniz theorem applies to any of those cases. This special case will be useful to us in fluid mechanics, however. I typed up a quick summary of the 3D Leibniz theorem. Here it is again. As I said, volume V of T is an arbitrary volume, not necessarily moving with the fluid. A of T is a surface area that encloses volume V. A moves with the volume, of course, since it's defining the volume. dA is the outward normal vector of a little element of area. Phi of X and T is any fluid property. And by the way, phi can be a scalar, vector, or even a tensor of any order. Phi is a function of space and time independent of what the volume is doing. It depends on the fluid or the fluid flow regardless of what we choose as our volume. Vector ua is the velocity vector defining the motion of surface A. And again, this velocity is not necessarily the same as the velocity of the fluid itself. Finally, everything we're talking about is in an Eulerian frame of reference. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.